Adrian Le Harvel joined the National Gallery of Ireland as a researcher in 1981. He set up and ran the prints and drawings department for several years, produced the first modern catalogues of works on paper and miniatures, and organised exhibitions. Subsequently, as curator of the permanent collection, he worked across the collections on research and loan exhibitions. For a time, he was in charge of the Irish collection and for many years now has been curator of British art. He has worked across the collection on catalogues and exhibitions, set up the prints and drawings department and was responsible for much of the continental rehang in the refurbished building recently. He has been researching and lecturing for almost 20 years on the relation between art and music with themes from the ancient to modern worlds. This covers performance, portraiture, stage design and social history in order to enhance knowledge and enjoyment. He has also contributed to numerous concert programmes and we are delighted to have Adrian with us today to present this guest lecture entitled A Visual History of the Orchestra, Part 1, Monteverdi to Haydn. Thank you, Adrian. Today, when we think of the orchestra, it's of groups of musicians, strings, brass, woodwind, percussion, and we feel it's always been there. But in fact, um, the concept really doesn't come together until the 18th century, and there are many precedents going back um, really to the ancient world. I'm going to hopefully show something of this um, range and also how visual sources can help you understand the history of the development, but also how things aren't quite perhaps uh, um, always the same as one actually reads about them. They were principally going from the uh, Monteverdi in the 17th century, this is the, the famous Strozzi portrait of him late in life, to Haydn, uh, Thomas Hardy, another celebrity portrait done when, he was, uh, when Haydn was in London. However, I'm going to start just by going back because um, these things did not just happen um, uh, out of nowhere. You'll gather from the portrait of uh, Handel behind me, I'm very much stuck in the 18th century. Anyway, back in Egypt, um, not what you immediately would think of as an orchestra. This is an assemblage with two types of harp. Um, we've got a, um, a, a lute and a aulos. But this is the sort of gentle music of the ancient world. And although not performing under a single direction, they certainly would have been heard together. This is celebrating the Feast of Horath, um, uh, a time of great drunkenness. And um, you can see why we benefit from the early record of the 19th century, because the original fresco, sadly, at Thebes is um, damaged. By the oh, Middle yeah. Ages, there were mixed yeah. reactions to music making. Um, you might get the impression from the, the great Portico de la Gloria at Santiago de Compostelo Cathedral that um, you had a lot of music going on, 24 different musicians here. Um, in fact, um, uh, most singing was a cappella, there was a little organ, and you did find some uh, music. It's, it's really a celebration of the instruments um, themselves. And equally in manuscripts is too jaunty, one 13th century lower, the upper 14th century. Um, if you put together um, even a light organ with a, a early viol and a fiddle and a, a, a cruath, um, it, it perhaps wouldn't sound too good. And certainly the upper one there with the debusing um, trumpets, they would drown out anything else that was going on at the same time. There's a wonderful century or so where altarpieces feature angels playing musical instruments. This is uh, one of the most splendid, the um, combined brothers Veneziano Coronation of the Virgin. And up in the um, register there, you can see this um, wonderful group of um, musicians together. Um, everything from, again, the Bucine to the delicate psaltery at the center being plucked. Um, ancestor of um, the harp itself, um, lute, um, prevalent instrument, even the drum at the side. But this is all fantasy. There's no music being composed for this sort of assemblage. Um, again, it's the idea of heavenly music um, that is being um, portrayed here. But it does give us good representations often of instruments. 
This is a particularly interesting depiction. Um, Jean de Nizière in the manuscript um, includes this group of musicians making secular music in the late 14th century. And you can see here this very different mindset um, of the Middle Ages that music is divided by its strength, outdoor, indoor. Um, down at the bottom, you've got um, trumpet um, and drum, and then you go up to sort of slightly gentler sounds, sort of uh, lute and portable organ, which is a very, very light um, sound. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got some strings and, and a horn inter interposing. And this is the idea that um, uh, music had categories um, rather than being seen as a, a group performance. And equally, I think, slightly fantasic, um, uh, this lovely um, illumination um, by Perrineau Lamy um, from the 15th century, um, where um, you find instruments certainly not associated with um, women. And it's an all-female so-called orchestra here, particularly that um, tenor pomard there in the center, um, real heavy, brutal of, of an instrument. Um, the pipe and table are much more associated even with um, the military on the left-hand side, um, and um, a lovely dulcimer on the, on the right-hand side. But again, for the instruments themselves, it's interesting to see evolution and um, recorder starting to take a more prominent um, role. The imagining of music, uh, the Venetians loved um, hearing music and of course they transplanted to the landscape setting. And here we have a, a typical pastoral. We've got a arrival at the keyboard uh, um, in, the, um, uh, in the virginal there. Um, and uh, the, the bass provided uh, both by the, the, the cornet, the, sort of the early um, precursor of brass instruments there in the center. If you ever hear one being played, um, it's got a real full um, sound. It, it looks like a woodwind, but it's much stronger than that. And um, the early, the bass viol there um, playing an, another important um, role in this sort of ensemble. But again, it's a, it's a made up um, sort of compilage. Much more modern perhaps to our eyes is we go to Munich, um, very important center for music making from the mid 16th century. Duke Albrecht V um, was not only a great patron, but a, um, a great uh, follower of Catholicism. Uh, the Jesuit church there, which he started, is, is still one of the largest north of the Alps. Quite a staggering experience. It must have been in the, in the 16th century to go into it. And then you could go here, Lassus, who was resident there from 1561, um, his latest mass, or here we see him at the center of his musicians. Uh, Hans Mielik was a, a close friend who illuminated various manuscripts of Lassus's work and put in these lavish illustrations. Um, you can see the wonderful group um, of um, musicians around him. Um, almost what we might think of as a, an orchestra. There's a good range um, here. He's, he's playing this, the, the table, um, uh, uh, the, uh, a virginal there, um, and you can see the transverse flutes arrived, recorder, again, the, the bass viol playing a, a very a prominent role. Um, ironically, of course, most of his music um, is a cappella, so it would not have been accompanied, but it, it is interesting that um, when um, Alessandro Strigio, famous, of course, for bringing the, his 40-part motet to London, where Thomas Tallis was inspired to imitate him. When he goes to Munich, it's performed with um, quite an orchestration, eight um, viol de braccio, eight flutes, eight trombones, harpsichord, harpsichord and bass lute continuo. So really quite a, an orchestration, uh, no percussion, but um, most of the other features we'd expect in a, a modern orchestra. And also on a smaller scale, um, the, the Collegium Musicum, sort of the grouping often of students at universities, um, dates back to the 16th century. We think of it much more with Bach, perhaps in Leipzig in the 18th century, but um, these groups are already coming together. And this is a, a rare early illustration of one of these um, groups. You can see the, uh, the beer in the center there. So it's, it's a convivial occasion, um, but um, serious music making and uh, a good range um, of instruments shown. This is a um, very precious little record that we have. It's actually British, um, 1596. And um, what makes it so special is it, it um, shows us 
um, not just the um, type of broken consort or mixed instruments that were very fashionable in the late 16th century um, in Britain. Um, you can actually follow exactly what um, is described in Thomas More's first book of consort lessons, 1599. You have the, the lute at the center leading, um, backed by the, the sitting to the, the right, then um, the transverse flute an octave higher. Um, you come down um, to the, the treble viol, who's really the first violin, um, and then the um, bandora, um, part of the, the bass continuo, along with the, the bass viol you see there actually being played on the knees. And here you have the constituents of what is going to evolve with the 17th century into um, more fuller orchestral music. At the center, playing this lute, in fact, is uh, Sir Henry Unton. And this is a, this amazing celebration of his life where that particular scene, you can see, is right down there at the bottom. It's a very small element, but it's a, a precious document in the, the evolution of the, the whole concept of a, an orchestra, of a, a group of different musicians actually coming together and um, playing against um, uh, 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 and, and with each other. This is small numbers. Um, you do then suddenly find the bigger courts are putting on um, larger festivities. Uh, and this is where we have a big gap because we, I can't visually show you exactly what these were like. Um, La Pellegrina, um, a series of five um, intermedi uh, as part of the, the festivities of um, a Medici wedding in Florence. Um, the libretto is published, as you can see here in Siena, 1589, um, but with no visual record. Um, alongside Claudio Monteverdi, probably. Um, this is this disputed portrait in Oxford, um, which we'd love it to be him, but um, it's quite a distance from the earliest uh, or the later portrait by Strozzi you saw earlier. And um, given that it includes, uh, interesting, a sort of an alto um, viol and uh, also um, the, the bass viol, which is he's holding, of course, it could well be an instrument maker. We think of Brescia and Cremona as the great centers of, of instrument making in Italy at the time. But it could be him, particularly because there is some music unidentified at the bottom. Um, this is just to give you a quick overview of big productions um, from the Pellegrino at the top. Um, down um, to uh, another Orfeo by Luigi Rossi done by Cardinal Mazarin in Paris. So really big occasions and calling for big musicians. And suddenly this is, a, this is quite a jump. You've got much more range. A lot of the instruments come in just as solo parts. Um, that's something we also find, of course, in um, big orchestral pieces today. Um, but um, it clearly shows that um, if it, the occasion demanded and if the resources were there, you could mount something much more ambitious. Just to show the illustration, that's one of the intermedi from the Pellegrina. This is typical. Um, invariably, um, great productions um, in the street and the theatres were documented for the sets and the actors. The orchestra was of really no interest. Apologies to musicians. Um, and one has these, these echoes, you might say, of what was. This is the um, now the Hall of Mirrors um, in the Plaza Ducale in Mantua. Um, imagine this as an open lodger um, with a um, rather different fresco decoration. And this was where Monteverdi put on his Friday evening concerts. Um, he did get a bit alarmed when the audience grew to 100. Um, so you can imagine the throng and then you'd have the musicians on top of that. And this is probably where um, his great Orfeo was seen because it's one of the few big spaces um, in the Palazzo Ducale. Musicians were rather shoved in the corner. Um, this is almost the same date. Um, uh, it's a dance. And of course, a reminder that music is being provided for other um, events. And um, again, a bit of a mixture here. Um, one is quite what sort of the, the, the lute would do whether it would actually stand up at all in this sort of company of rather strong strings and also the, the harp there on the left-hand side. But um, uh, it, it, something of the diversity. And a reminder of just how few images we have uh, maybe of the, of the times. Um, this is a 
slightly perplexing one. Um, it's a religious occasion. It's a, it's a mass, supposedly, in a Paris church, because that's where the artist Pierre-Paul Sivin is working. Um, but it's hard to read. Um, what is an interesting feature is this idea of the banked musicians right up um, almost to the, the, the ceiling there. And this is a feature, um, think, list at the Gewandhaus in 1835. This is exactly the same arrangement for his um, musicians. Um, coming in, um, because of the technique, it's a, it's a sort of ink and watercolor, it's very hard to read, but you, again, you get, just see the instruments coming out, you can see um, uh, the trombone, you can see harp, um, uh, uh, the gamba now, um, a trumpet, even a serpent there on the right hand side, so some idea, and also significantly our first view of a, a conductor. Um, this is a difficult role because um, invariably it would be the composer often seated at um, a harpsichord who would be directing a musical events or an organ, um, and the leader of the orchestra also felt it was their role to sort of coordinate a large group um, so uh, these figures start to appear waving rolls of paper. So this is the pre-Baton age. Um, and not always perhaps getting the um, uh, notice that they um, seem to in images. Uh, we've got four organs here. We first have four choirs, but it's not easy to distinguish them um, lower down. I was a bit amazed, um, only realized quite recently that um, probably the earliest illustrations of um, an orchestra in a theater, uh, uh, not until the era of Jean-Baptiste Lully. Um, and the performances that um, he is putting on um, and providing music for often um, at Versailles. Uh, temporary theaters um, at the top here, you see, um, the, I think the earliest I found, uh, Molière's La Princesse de Lide. And um, you've got to also change your mindset. Uh, dramas right into the 19th century would have musical accompaniment, even Shakespeare. So Moliere would not only have um, uh, prologue music, but there'd be interact, and often you've got ballets thrown in as well. Um, down below, they've actually used the marble court chart. They brought in some orange trees and um, the orchestra. And one nice little detail is you'll notice that, well, you can't see much in the top one, I admit, but down below, you get a better idea of the 40 or so musicians, but they've been divided because the king didn't want his view to be interrupted by them. Uh, it wasn't always the case. This is another Moliere production, Malade Imaginaire, where we know there was ballet between the acts. Today we'd see this as a straightforward drama. And again, you can see a little more of the instruments. See, in very it's the, the big double basses um, that tend to sort of appear out or the um, violinists who get highlighted, but th this is now sort of much more organized. Um, Lully, of course, has got access not just to the great um, 24 violins of the king, um, violins, viola, um, uh, and cello, but um, also he is out to set up his petit violon, his more experimental work, and they could bring in extras, um, uh, brass and um, timpani from the military side, the, the, the Grand Écurie um, at Versailles. And for, particularly Lewis music, you know, it needs a bit of bombast often. Um, this is a, another rewarding image. We've jumped to Dresden. The Purple Man's new opera house has just opened in 1719. So they put on a really big opera and they bring in an Italian, of course, because Italian opera is the tops. And Lotte's Tiafane is the choice. And down there, we have the orchestra pit. And you're probably saying, I'm not seeing a great deal here, but it does blow up very beautifully. This is the original drawing. You're just looking at the engraving made from it. And um, again, we've got a, um, a, a great um, assemblage here um, of musical instruments. Um, despite the, the number that uh, we can see, and we've got everything, we see a, a, a nice arch lute, sort of tall lute there on the left-hand side. You've got the corders. Um, obviously, you've got the, the strings, cellos, um, but we know there was percussion. Um, in the orchestra setting, uh, direction is often given at the center or the side, so the, the central harpsichord here um, uh, is a very important part. Uh, and obviously, this is where the music is sort of being directed from, but more perhaps by 
gesture, um, as you can uh, still see in um, many performances today, particularly of concertos, um, where the, the performer there will actually uh, conduct the audiences, uh, the orchestra as well. Turin, very shortly afterwards, another big production put on um, at the Royal Palace, a non-specific um, opera here, but it's, it's showing a, a great occasion. Um, and uh, again, we've got uh, the um, arch lute at the right, now on the way out, it's, um, you know, as, as other parts of the orchestra developed, it became um, less important, but you see they brought in um, well, a clearly military trumpets there on the left-hand side, um, and uh, we have a direction in this occasion, um, we've got two harpsichordists, one of whom presumably was in charge um, of events going on. And this was produced as a very grand engraving, as you can see here, uh, it's it's called. it tend to be uh, big uh, marriages or um, visits that got celebrated with a, a big opera. But it's not all in the theater because, um, Although uh, there are constraints, um, the, the, the box and, the, and the, the, the lineup for how the orchestra might look, um, the players would be redeployed to different areas. And uh, this is an unknown artist, but a typical of a sort of a secular music making where you get a group being brought together um, here um, at the Palazzo Ducale in Colorno um, and uh, playing from a communal um, playing desk, um, variety of instruments, and uh, uh, timpanists, you can see uh, right there um, at the center, obviously making quite a, a raucous um, sound. And even um, little incidental illustrations are interesting. This is a, um, a, sort of a, a document about uh, various matters, but it, it, it includes this rather nice little scene of a dance. This, probably a minuet um, at the start of a ball. And there you've got the orchestra in the background. Um, not a dominated, slightly ungainly, um, uh, probably meant to be a, a cello player. You could play it on your on knees. So it's, it's, it seems to be a bit oversized here, but uh, uh, you can see a more normal one on the right-hand side. Um, you've now got trombone, you've got horns. Um, uh, and a variety of um, different uh, instruments. As a reminder, you have to look into different sources. Now, um, it's not all serious. Um, the runaway hit of 1728 in London, the Beggar's Opera, um, John Gay's sort of compilation of popular um, songs, um, obviously had an orchestra at Drury Lane Theatre. Uh, what's amazing is that everyone has picked over the details of the production, um, but there's no mention anywhere of the orchestra. Um, one imagines it really wasn't quite like this satirical print. Uh, 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 Beggar's Opera was a satire on Italian high opera, so it's now gone even further. You can see the, the singers have acquired animal heads. Um, and this rather delightful little orchestra here at the foreground, uh, um, bagpipes, Jews, harp, dulcimer, um, tin can, and uh, my favorite, the, the pig's bladder. Um, uh, whether this is a cello or a viola de gamba, um, not quite sure, but it, it didn't seem to catch on. And more seriously, um, a little group. Uh, the, the previous print was long misattributed to William Hogarth, so it's rather appropriate that Hogarth did provide a, a ticket here for um, a concert at Mary's Chapel, and this sort of um, small assemblage um, really gives you most of the, the range of a, 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 an orchestra. And to make the fact that the uh, underlying fact it is a, a orchestrated group, you can see there is a, a conductor figure there at the, um, the right hand side. Um, uh, the the harp's called got violins, um, double bass, cello violin, recorder, transverse flute. So um, actually quite a nice mixture and capable of um, producing a good sound. Um, uh, this is just, of course, the era of Handel. And uh, uh, when I was at the, the premiere um, in 2015, if it's 1707 um, uh, uh, oratorio, the first time we've been heard in Dublin, um, there were only 10 musicians and almost exactly this composition, not even um, uh, 
flautist, um, but capable with a, a portable organ of producing quite enough sound for a, a, quite a, an impressive um, piece. The amateur is also arriving and a lot of music, of course, in the 18th century is being written directly for that market as um, playing expanded beyond just the sort of the professional bodies. Um, this is a, uh, another, like, like many images today, a very rare image um, of a, a private musical party in Norfolk um, visiting German artist um, John Hines, as he christened himself, um, recorded it. And we actually have the names of the figures, included two of the local reverends. And um, you can see, uh, again, a similar range of um, instruments um, to the little print we're just looking at. Um, they're not exactly, you might say, playing together. They're in sort of little groups, but they are sharing music stands, at least, uh, amongst them and presumably under some overall um, direction. Sorry, my own screen is... No, sorry. Um... Uh, near at home, just again, just to show you, it's, it's not so far from um, sort of fantasy. This is a, a concert actually in the organ room in the academy in 18th century um, setting, um, at the centre there, uh, half scores you can see in around um, strings, and we have a singer on this occasion. This used to be called Handel listening to an oratory. In fact, the figure on the right-hand side there, I've blown it up slightly, it should be a, a complete um, circle, um, is probably the patron of the occasion. Um, but um, it could well be an oratory. There's a big bank of singers, uh, and then we've got the sort of the, um, uh, like the term an orchestra is enough there, I think, to constitute it and sort of the range um, of um, instruments. Um, uh, unknown artist about um, 1740, being screened from Dublin, we did have to mention Messiah, uh, first performed in 1742. Um, and if the famous music hall recently opened is no longer extant, um, you can get some idea of the inside space from the courtyard um, where um, it once stood, um, as you can see here on the right hand side. Um, this is another of these frustrating occasions um, where we know exactly. Um, how many uh, musicians um, were there um, during the um, actual performance. But um, we would just dearly love to have um, some sort of um, record. It was quite small, it was about um, uh, nine or ten um, under Matthew Dubourg, who did the premiere with larger forces of Covent Garden the following year. Um, and Handel himself is uh, there playing the, the, the portable of organ at the centre of it. They even had to bring in the drums, uh, one drum um, from the state band at the castle. Um, uh, and uh, Handel himself, of course, would often borrow um, from the Tower of London in, in London. So uh, there's a lot of movement of, of instruments. I thought I'd better have a, a quick word about um, the period performance. Um, looking at early images, um, you get some idea of disposition and composition, but um, obviously not quite how sounds came together. And we have to remember just how much had to be uh, uh, done by the musicians themselves and also how things have evolved. Uh, this is a wonderfully charming photo at the top here of um, Arnold Dolmetsch, the great instrument maker, getting together with friends in the 1930s. They look a bit medieval, but there is actually a harpsichord included. So um, one suspects it is a lot of late in music they're trying to play. Um, and from Studying almost with a sort of um, pedantic dryness, old records, um, reimaginings, um, interpretations, uh, allying to modern instruments. Um, the whole period movement has um, greatly changed, and um, its empathy, which is now emphasized, of course, has influenced the, the mainstream. Um, one of the founding groups, and there are quite a number, one could mention the London classical players with um, Sir Roger Norrington, who's still with us, um, still wonderfully lucid and uh, still looking at original manuscripts, particularly for sort of inspiration, but um, aware that music is, uh, um, it's like jelly. I mean, it, it, it molds and um, uh, you, you can't go back and just find the right way to do anything. But it, it, it's obviously something that is a, 
um, an ongoing um, uh, development. And of course, you can also dress up uh, the, the Dutch orchestra of the 18th century, obviously like their wigs, as you can see here. And whether you stand or sit is another um, little subtext. Another unexpected source, one of these um, collegian musicum, this time at the University of Jena, um, where you can see um, a rehearsal going on and a good grouping of the, the real range. And we've got the whole range of the orchestra here, everything down to the harp score, the, the tempanist, um, uh, your strings and woodwind and more instruments actually hanging on the, the table. Sorry. Um, that was the rehearsing. They did an outdoor performance, as you can see at the top there, um, where again you get this, this interesting arrangement um, of, of the musicians. And I wonder how it actually affected the sound. They do seem to be playing more in towards themselves, even than the um, audience around. The many great patrons of the 18th century, all the courts seem to, to need uh, a major composer, um, orchestras grow in scale. Um, we have nothing to illustrate the great Mannheim Orchestra, where the, the, the symphony, of course, goes through a major development. Um, and sparse little of someone like Frederick the Great. Um, he might have been a great military political figure, but uh, he was also an active composer. Um, uh, two flute concertos, um, flute sonatos. He's got um, Joachim Kvantz providing flute music for him, because that's his favorite instrument. Um, played every evening um, and rehearsed. Um, and uh, here you see him in this, this um, very rare image um, of him at Sans Souci. Um, this is what you have to imagine. Uh, this is the music room with the, uh, one of the Antoine Pen paintings and all the uh, fabulous wazari among the Silverman instruments, such as Bach came to play on. Um, so uh, we get I'm afraid not a great idea, but at least a, a remembrance of the importance um, of um, court music. Dresden's another great centre, particularly for opera, and its orchestra under Johann Haas from 1731, um, when he built up um, quite a large body of musicians, who's um, very famed. Uh, Johann Kendler, the great modeler at Meissen, uh, produced this rather fun monkey orchestra, the Saint-Gerie, a great thing of the 18th century, everything to do with monkeys. Um, uh, and we've got um, almost 20 instruments here. We've got the singers thrown in and there is a conductor, you can see uh, a rather manic figure in wig at the um, lower left. This is the plan um, of his orchestra, much like a modern one, except the fact that he would be there at the center. You can see the outline of the harpsichord. Um, flanked by his first, second violin, Scott violas, um, his woodwind, his trumpets, and um, a second harpsichord. And then the um, brass and timpani were right there at the extremes. So and we'd love a visual representation. At least we have this plan that was done at the time. It was obviously a very celebrated or um, orchestra. The configuration is again um, for the theater because he's working principally uh, at the Opera House in Dresden. Uh, but uh, uh, I say the, Musicians would obviously play around the court. Um, here you actually see a theatre. This is uh, um, now in um, uh, Turin, the, um, uh, the Teatro Reggio, where we see Feo's Asace being performed. And you can see the pit. Um, here the harpsichords at either end. You've got musicians in between in ranges. Um, a brass kept the, the side with the deeper of the string instruments, double basses. And some idea of the splendor, of course, of a great opera house in the 18th century. Um, one nice or two nice little details are that they, they do serve refreshments during the performance, as you can see at the bottom there. And you always seem to have a soldier um, uh, on hand. I don't know whether they thought the audience or the orchestra were going to run amok. Anyway, um, interesting detail. The, the French seem to get very interested in depicting orchestras and uh, about half a dozen um, 18th century representations. Um, generally, um, unusual theatres. This is the, um, the great stables, the Grand Écurie at Versailles, where they've actually converted it uh, for a performance of Rameau's Princesse de Navarre. Um, and we get a, a good view of the um, orchestra there. Um, a conductor 
uh, taking quite a, a prominent role and obviously concentrating on the singers as well um, as the um, musicians who arranged around him um, up to about, I think it's about 40, I did a count. Now, it's obviously not a photographic record, but it, at least it gives an idea of how it impressed people at the time. And here you actually see a theatre. Um, the court theatres tend to survive better than commercial ones, which were constantly being rebuilt or burning down. Um, and by rights, the old theatre in the um, uh, of the court, uh, you can see a, a nice enclosure um, specifying um, for the the orchestra uh, as they start to take on a more prominent position um, in the theatre. Sometimes they even appeared on stage. Um, Paolo Panini um, here with th this very grand performance um, of a Vinci opera, Contessa del Numi, um, at the Teatro Argentina in Rome. The theatre is one of the few theatres that uh, still survives. Um, here they got 70 musicians uh, on, a, on a head count on stage um, uh, as part of the opera. In fact, very much part because uh, uh, you can see they're almost getting subsumed in the clouds, which are part of the um, uh, the enactment and uh, the double bases here, right um, here at the front of the, the stage. This is one of a series of festivities paintings that Panini did. It's the only one he did of a theater. And back, uh, oh, sorry, in, in Vienna, um, the fascination of everything Turkish of the 18th century comes through in um, various operas. Here we have uh, Le Turc Généreux, um, and in the, the pit, um, the, quite a detailed view. Again, Bernardo Bellotto, who's a, a topographical artist of city views, and so he very precisely um, renders the details um, of musicians. Uh, sadly, you can't see too clearly the ones at the backs, but there are the violinists, and you can see um, uh, a little of the, the woodwind as well. But um, acting, obviously, much more under um, the, the leader here, because there's, there's no sort of central um, figure. And uh, partly for fun, but just to show you the sort of the, uh, what a, a pit looks like uh, as a good aerial view, um, uh, the musicians have, dre have fled. Uh, there was a riot at Covent Garden when they refused to honor half price tickets after a change of management. Um, and uh, Arns and Texas, uh, another Turkish um, style opera, got interrupted, as you can see. Uh, the orchestra has mostly fled or they're cowering in the, in the foreground. It does at least give you um, a, a view and a uh, uh, the, the, the candle's still in place. And the uh, lineup we haven't seen um, before um, when Gluck's Panasso Confuso um, had its premiere um, at the Schoenbrunn Palace in Vienna. Uh, he probably played harpsichord. This may be meant to be a portrait of him at the center there. Um, and his, or his orchestra is all around him. Uh, the violin is having to compete here with the, the natural trumpets um, and uh, the, the woodwind double bass to the side. It's probably not the whole orchestra, but it gives you some um, impression. Um, here in a sort of temporary setup, they just had a sort of a screen thrown up to separate them slightly. Um, here you see the, the whole room itself with the emphasis, of course, really on the, the guests of the occasion. I go from large to small, um, unknown artist. This is a, a, a Venetian palazzo um, where um, we see a, a concert being put on. Um, earliest concerts uh, date right back to 1660 in Hamburg, got Telemann later putting on concerts, L London 1672, uh, Concert Spirituel then comes in. The um, uh, reason I haven't referred to them so far is because we just know visual imagery. Um, by the 18th century, of course, the, the concert is becoming much more established and being opened up to a more general public. You could still have quite a grand grouping in private. And here you can see a, a nice range of instruments. Um, sort of little details you can pick up. The, the horn slung over the shoulder on the left-hand side of the um, musician. They are playing at table. And of course, you can think of uh, Telemann's table music. Um, and uh, we've got a table harpsichord here in the center. And 
unexpected um, Zurich. Um, here we have Bürgermeister Johann Fries putting on quite a um, concert. Over 13 musicians, two harpsichords um, in sort of V-shaped dead center, the rest standing around a, a large table stand. It would be quite exhausting. I, mean, I, I have been at a concert where uh, a full orchestra stood for about two hours, but it, uh, not perhaps the most comfortable position to be um, playing in. And um, more out of doors now, um, the Pleasure Gardens of London, um, Vauxhall Gardens here um, from 1735, specialised in providing music. And here we see music stand. The, the um, left-hand image is a, a fan that was produced um, uh, showing um, a very good detail um, of the um, musicians, uh, uh, big emphasis on brass, because obviously that would carry, but you also get some violinists and woodwind. Um, and rather clearer, um, almost 60 years later, um, a detail from um, a print after Rodinson, um, where you can see again the, the brass, that there was an organ provided, Madame Vexel, who's um, singing from the, um, the front, um, and um, a nice sort of smart livery. The other great gardens were Ranelagh, uh, where you could go out of doors, but they also had this rotunda. Um, Canaletto on his London visit perhaps overemphasizes the size a little, um, but it, it was quite a, a grand interior. It was a sort of heating stove right there in the center. And on the right hand side, you can see um, an orchestra uh, in tears. Um, uh, if you know anything of Candeletto's work, um, his uh, figures tend to get rather like blobs as his uh, career um, uh, went on. Um, and here, most of that um, would apply, I think, to musicians, but you can see instruments. You can see certainly the double basses there uh, at the back and some idea of the, the number who are being um, employed. And there's also um, an organ. I said weddings and big occasions, uh, here we are. Um, at the, the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, 1760. Um, this is the first stereo orchestra I've actually seen. You can um, uh, see uh, uh, some sort of division left and right, uh, not all instruments being played. You can see the big double bass there on the floor on the right hand side, and possibly, uh, obviously, a little imagination taking, but um, it, it does um, offer an interesting idea of how the, the sound would have carried in the room. And you don't have to be grand. Um, Bolzano, uh, sort of northern Italy, the, the parish church orchestra, as the print clearly says, um, it was quite ambitious. I mean, they've got, they got, they got trumpets, they've got timpani, violins, um, uh, you can see horns there in, in the foreground playing here um, out of doors, the added difficulty. As, instance here of Shakespeare with music. Um, uh, it's actually a satire because uh, William Dawes considered that Shakespeare was being bowdlerized on the stage. So we've got some very satirical elements in costuming the dead hero, but a um, little orchestra there in the foreground and the main elements is not as many as there would have been perhaps, but you've got the different constituents at least um, of the, the orchestra and the general, general sense of gusto London's biggest occasions, um, often musical, um, and particularly the centenary um, uh, for Handel, um, uh, took place in Westminster Abbey, and there was this mass rank of musicians. Samuel Green, the organ maker, provided an instrument um, just for this occasion, which was, uh, uh, still survives elsewhere. Um, and Joa Banks actually conducted in fact, he, he played the organ by, by pipes right there from the center. You can see all the singers. Um, unless you think it's imaginary, we've actually got the plan. So you can literally look at each grouping exactly where they were placed. And this is not so unlike a, a, the modern disposition of a, an orchestra. Um, not every source is informative. There's a very large painting at Yale by Edward Edwards, which you'd think would tell you a lot of information. It's supposed to have portraits in, none of which has been discerned. Um, but um, the 
background area you've just been looking at is against the, the west window. It really is just a sort of a blur. I have to mention Mozart, um, and um, of all his portraits, none actually shows him um, playing in an orchestra. Um, this was thought to be him and thought to be by Johann Zoffni when the Mozartium in Salzburg acquired it. Um, uh, it proved wrong on both counts, but it is fascinating because um, it shows a 24 piece orchestra um, grouped together um, and in some detail, I mean, you, you can really read the um, actual construction of the um, instruments here. Um, it is made up, uh, the visible scores, um, uh, just two examples. One is uh, um, D major for viola and flute, uh, G major, uh, sorry, D major for viola and flute, G major for horn. Um, uh, so we're not quite sure what they're playing. Um, and it's, it's probably much more meant to be a, an idea of the orchestra, um, particularly as you can see the uh, translated the inscription on the harpsichord, uh, listen in peace if you want to live peaceably. Um, Mozart um, deserves a full serving himself because obviously he does so much to uh, develop the orchestration, but um, even now um, it's interesting to um, hear sort of great performers um, saying, looking at his manuscripts, so much was actually left to be filled in. He, of course, would play the solo parts for concertos. Um, uh, and uh, even in the um, orchestration. Back in Paris, the Comédie Italienne, um, 1772, uh, again, is, is sort of really a headshot, but it shows the um, uh, uh, large numbers being um, put together for um, theatre orchestras, particularly when there's so many theatres in one um, city. And even after the revolution, um, Monsigny's Le Déserteur had been put on in 1767, um, was revived because it had very revolutionary themes. Um, it's an early escape opera where the hero is saved at the last moment. And here you see it at the Opera Comique. Um, uh, Orcs is a little depleted, which would not be surprising given the number of musicians who either fled or were executed um, after the um, revolution. Even composers find it hard to um, survive and turning to revolutionary pieces. So to Haydn, and um, what little visual information I can offer you, uh, this is probably the most famous um, depiction of his work at Esther um, uh, Haze, at Haza, where he's, he's working with the Esther Hazy family um, for 30 or so years. Um, they didn't put off on opera very often because of the expense, um, but uh, this is one that he was um, involved with um, and possibly a portrait of him at the Harps Court conducting. It would certainly be where um, he would be expected to be. Um, interestingly, he's the only one who's not in livery. Um, just come in for a, a slight detail there. When you think he was um, producing uh, something like uh, three concertos, uh, sorry, uh, three symphonies, two concertos a year consistently, uh, obviously there was a demand for uh, orchestral music um, uh, from the family, um, but just nobody thought it was worth actually um, showing it being performed. And here we have the music room where so much of it must have been heard. This is a very grand palace, as you can see. It was inspired by Versailles. Um, and the um, opera house, uh, sadly, uh, no longer extant. We have one painting in the National Gallery of Ireland, which actually is uh, of interest because uh, um, it may be a fancy dress ball by a uh, uh, German artist, Matthias Schiffer, who specialized in these strange perspective views. And um, there on the right-hand side though, we have a, a little group of musicians who could well be um, playing a Mozart or a, a Haydn um, symphony. Haydn really um, found um, how famous he was when he got to London in 1791, the first of his two visits. Um, and um, he particularly performed at the Hanover Square Rooms. Um, 
we would love to see him in action. Um, this is the earliest view, it's much later, but it shows how the 18th century hall looked. Uh, it was built in 1774 on Hanover Square, it's a private concert hall, um, and uh, it was the key um, venue. Um, significantly, um, Haydn turned down the opportunity to perform at the Freemasons Hall because uh, he was heard the orchestra wouldn't bother to rehearse. So he certainly wasn't going there. Um, uh, at his performances, um, eyewitnesses uh, included Charlotte Panadic, Lady of Waiting to the Queen. You see her in this beautiful drawing by Thomas Lawrence with her son Lawrence, um, uh, uh, in, now in the Met. Um, and um, she gave a very full description. The, the fanned um, layout of the orchestra uh, here back with the piano at the centre, uh, very much what you'd expect to see with a modern orchestra and much due to Haydn's rethinking of um, how the orchestra should be displayed and um, how the, the sound should be um, brought together. But things were still a bit edgy. Um, he thought he was conducting, um, but uh, Wilhelm Kramer, um, a veteran of Mannheim, violinist, in fact, the first violin, decided he was definitely the conductor. So there was a bit of sort of tension at times um, between them. Um, certainly, if one reads the descriptions, um, I, I just um, which is one, we both have been there, but also we had some, some visual to go with it because you've, got, you've really got all the elements of a, a big modern orchestra now being um, uh, in, involved. An ending um, with um, the last illustration we have of um, Haydn, um, when creation was put on in the banqueting hall of the University of Vienna in 1808, it was a really big occasion, everyone was there, um, Salieri conducted from the harpsichord, Beethoven was in the um, audience, and um, seated right at the, at the centre, um, there was the aged um, Haydn, um, a year before his death. And you get some idea of the orchestration in the back. Now, uh, it's just a pity that um, the illustration was originally on a snuff box um, uh, uh, or a pill box, um, tiny. It was engraved. And so the engraving is all that we have now. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't really blow up too well. But it, it, at least it gives you some um, sense of... Um, what we're now seeing to be a much more um, modern orchestra, as a, uh, if you think of uh, um, what Haydn did uh, in music, um, an incredible um, achievement in, in all fields, and um, really setting the scene um, for his successors, um, and uh, that will be continued um, with Beethoven. Thank you.